it is it's good to see a lot of YouTube people in here. But yeah, just to reiterate, our this space is we're gonna have to postpone it because of Twitter's issues. People on Twitter can't hear the reason why you guys have been able to hear this. This is Eli, by the way, is that I patched through the audio from my phone to this YouTube version, but apparently people could not here on Twitter unless they were a speaker in the space. So that allowed, that totally ruined the entire uh, purpose of it. The fact that there wasn't anything in there. Um, yeah, but just some really quick thoughts on uh, this four game sweep, or as they call it, a mop. It's more than just a sweep, right? If it's three, if four games instead of the usual three, you need a stronger adjective for it. Well, stronger noun for it, I guess. Uh, so that was just a really satisfying uh, series didn't really put away all of the team's concerns that we have about it at the moment. Um, but the main thing being that the offense ticked up, especially when it comes to slugging a uh, big surprise, pleasant surprise, considering the absence of Jorge Soler. Soler did not play at all during these four games. And yet they were still able to uh, find a way to average close to eight runs per game over the course of these four games against the Nationals, finishing the season series against the Nats. Don't get to face them and beat up on them until 2024. Um, but as of this moment, I think we might get, yes, live reaction to the Diamondbacks losing again, the Giants losing again, the updated wildcard standings. It's a three-way tie for the third wildcard spot between the Diamondbacks, Marlins, and Giants. The Reds now actually a fraction of a percentage point behind those three teams technically past the reds today because of that final win. So, wow. Um, amazing how quickly things turn in just a few days. I think that speaks pretty heavily to the fact that none of these other wildcard teams have, um, none of them are well-rounded complete teams either. You know, these are, this final spot is going to be, and, and you shouldn't totally punt on the possibility of the second wild card spot yet. I was almost ready to, but you look at the Cubs, it's only three games up with 25 to play. It's possible to catch the Cubs um, for that. That one's not totally over yet. I think the Marlins even have the uh, tiebreaker against the Cubs as I, as I double check this. The only thing that's kind of anticlimactic about the end of this season is that the Marlins don't have very much head-to-head -head games remaining against these teams, but they own the tiebreaker against the Cubs by virtue of winning the season series. They own the tiebreaker against the Diamondbacks by the exact same thing. When it comes to the Giants, they split that, and they split with the Reds as well, so those will come down to intra-division record um, between them. Um, so as, as we were talking about in our <laughs> Fish on First staff chat, as much as I want to continue rambling here, we might have to uh, reorganize our staff fantasy football draft. Um, should fall during the draft. Hmm. Yeah, so what we're going to talk that out. Yeah, uh, appreciate Sarif checking in and a lot of our usuals in here as well. It's only Eli here. Uh, just to reiterate one more time, the normal Twitter space postponed because of technical issues on Twitter that prevented listeners on Twitter from actually hearing what we were saying and all that stuff. Um, but now heading into Labor Day, it's an off day for the Marlins. It's a we've look, pointed to this stretch a little bit earlier, probably in the last space, is that now this is a period of 16 straight days with 16 games, no off days in between. And the expectation, it has not been confirmed, the expectation is that the Marlins will go with a six-man rotation, like a hybrid six-man, where Edward Cabrera rejoins the mix. Sandy continues to pitch on his normal schedule. Um but uh, they, for the first time in kind of recent memory, they potentially could go two or three times through a rotation with six guys instead of the usual five, a benefit of having the expanded rosters. Yeah, no offense to Jeff Hartlieb, but right now he is holding down the final pitching spot on their roster, and you don't really trust him to uh, contribute much down the stretch. So uh, we will see what that corresponding roster move is, whether it's Tuesday or Wednesday. Um, given the off day, actually, they probably might wait till Wednesday before making that move. <laughs> a 10-game winning streak incoming. Well, this was the longest winning streak that they've had now since June, since late June. Is, this is the first time they've won four in a row um, during that period of time this team has done. And they've done it despite uh, a couple very big minuses on the position player side with both Joey Wendell and Yuli Gurriel. I think I'm going to put out an article on that either tomorrow or on Tuesday about what you do with them. 
um, because they're both well-regarded veteran presences uh, on this team, but they're both absolutely terrible at hitting uh, the baseball. With Yuli, um, he was, for the first half of the year, he was showing signs of a bounce-back season, and now you just update the stats to today, and they are perhaps slightly worse than they were in 2022. And even unless he is a super duper star with the glove, and as today also showed, you know, he can't make every single play defensively. It's it's really just hard to find situations to put him on the field and expect positive contributions here. It's such a small role with Josh Bell playing every day. As long as Jorge Soler is past the uh, concern with with uh, his bat, his hip issue, then between those two, man, there's just not many plate appearances that you'd want Yuli to ever take at any point for this team. And then with Wendell, he is still the best defensive shortstop on this roster. I've reiterated again and again that Xavier Edwards just is not a shortstop. He's just not a possibility there. Um, so if you're not going to play Wendell, it means splitting Hampson and Birdie at that position. And I think that is probably what the team should be doing moving forward because Wendell's offensive struggles are even over a bigger sample size than Yuli's. And it's just, even if he plays a premium defensive position, he's another guy where unless it's against very select matchups, he should be a very small part of this team. You could go way back to the all-star break and Wendell is hitting 144. I, it is I, just egregious. 144 for Joey Wendell dating back to his last 39 games. Well, including today, that's gone up. I think, did he have a hit today? He may have put that up a little bit today. Wendell today went over four. I'm sorry. So that went down even further. Um, over a month and a half sample just doesn't get on base, doesn't hit for power, and doesn't even, he makes an average amount of contact. But, <laughs> but the thing is, they don't want to cut them because they still, well, in Wendell's case, it's a more substantial amount of money that they still owe him. I don't think that really holds you back at this stage of the season. Again, it's just about the fact that he plays shortstop and that uh, I, if you get rid of him, you know, who is really going to be a valuable member of the roster with that spot? Uh, maybe Troy Johnston. At least one of you mentioned Troy Johnston as if he's just a pinch hitter alone. You know, that's something that you could get from him. Um, but at the same time, he, it, it's hard to find at-bats for him as well, just considering his position. And the rest of that AAA team right now, there's just not... Uh, Dane Myers is probably the other one that's kind of in that same conversation where he's very little left to prove at AAA. And we've already seen over small samples in the big leagues that he can hit solid line drives to all fields. Um, like There is some upside there. There's also the downside of him just being way too aggressive and not seeing breaking balls the right way. And Dane Myers, yeah, let's see, he's playing tonight in center field, um, but I don't really like his center field defense. Yeah, the, the thing is, as much as those two in uh, Wendell and Guriel are kind of black holes offensively, th there aren't a ton of other sexy options in the organization right now. I would have preferred, like, if they had gone out and claimed somebody off waivers, one of those, any of those outfielders that were available in Bader and Renfro or even Randall Gritchick, I would have preferred having those guys on the roster over Wendell or Gurriel. But because they declined to claim those guys, uh, I, I just don't know how you can. It, it's hard in the clubhouse to justify getting rid of either of them and then calling up somebody from Triple A that hasn't had any major league success because there is a possibility that, as promising as those younger guys are, inexperienced guys are that it's possible that they are going to be just as bad down the stretch in a small sample. Um, yeah. With that being said, I got to check in again with, with my staff in here about our fantasy draft. Uh, Kevin is listening. I know he is that. Yes, I can do the draft tonight. If you guys want instead of this, we'll see what they say as we try to organize our staff fantasy draft. But let me just check the comments and see if there's uh, anything else we want to touch on about, you know, Sean brings up that they were willing to cut bait with Jorge Lopez. That was a slightly different situation. They left him available for other teams to claim. The Orioles were the only team that took a flyer on him just because he had their uh, history of working out well in Baltimore. 
And the Orioles took responsibility for the rest of the money that Lopez was still owed for this season. So that was a pretty big factor in it. That would, that's the difference between cutting him versus putting him on waivers. As I see that Lopez pitched a scoreless inning for the Orioles today in a, not a high leverage situation, but in the eighth inning with the team leading by four runs. So that's predictable, isn't it? That he just goes back to uh, where he was an all-star last year and, and figures it out again. Um, and Averett, yeah, and then Nakib brings up the idea of shortstops in the offseason. That, that's the big thing that's going to ha- hang over the Marlins, regardless of how the rest of the offseason goes, is shortstop and catcher. Catcher and shortstop. They've made it this far this year without having a real answer at those positions, but the free agent offerings for those spots this year are so dreadful. There's... um. On the catching side, like the maybe the most attractive one out there is uh, Mitch Garver, who is who rakes when he plays, but he just doesn't play very much at all whatsoever. He doesn't stay healthy. And then on the shortstop side, it's Med Rosario. Um, that was somebody I was kind of intrigued about entering the year, but he has regressed quite a bit to more of the player that we thought he would be. Uh, yeah, outside of Ahmed Rosario, there's just nothing out there at shortstop free agency. Um, unless you want to take a flyer on Tim Anderson, unless p- potentially the White Sox um, cheap out on Tim Anderson, cut bait on him, and you take him as a reclamation project coming off of this year. But yeah, as uh, Sharif brings up in the chat, yeah, small ball was, was part of it, was part of the uh, success that they had. It was good to see with... Edwards laid down uh, his first bunt hit, his first of many bunt hits in the majors. I had this uh, quick back and forth with my buddy Aram Layden of Just Baseball about Edwards. He is Aram is a pretty big skeptic about Edwards moving forward, mainly because he just does not hit the ball hard at all. He is really far down. Um, he, he hits his uh, batted ball stats are kind of at the level where you just don't see guys reach the big leagues if they don't have the ability to make super hard contact but with him what i point out is that his numbers are kind of brought down a bit by his bunts uh he bunts very frequently in triple a and he had so much success doing it of course the fact that he was leading the triple a international league batting title race so yeah, that's an element of his game that i think does raise his floor as a player i just reiterate again that uh, edwards is not a shortstop and i mean really anywhere besides second base when you try to play him there i just don't think you can expect um even decent defense there. Uh, he's a de- he's, he's obviously very fast and he's a decent athlete, but a lot of the other fundamentals and in particular his arm, both the strength of his arm, the accuracy of his arm. Um, I've even heard about the the movement of his throws um, across the diamonds. Like it's just, it's a struggle and he's still young enough that some of that is fixable with hard work and with reps uh, with the right, coaching and teammates like you could figure that out and get a little bit better but uh for the moment he's a defensive liability and that's kind of why it took him so long to get up here and that's why i i don't think he's gonna play he's not gonna start a lot of games down the stretch even though he is on this team because him and Luis arise play the same position and arise is a much better second baseman i think this year than edwards is surprisingly enough so check in here about what is going on with this fish on first fantasy draft? Are we going to do it tonight or not? But I think I'll, I'll wrap up this, this impromptu podcast right here. Um, we'll try state of the fish soon. Uh, we don't want to wait for next Sunday. So, uh, whatever unforeseen technical issues, hopefully they are resolved by the end of tonight and we can just, Tried again on Labor Day sometime that day. I don't know what the audience would be like because I'm sure some of you have plans w- away from uh, the usual stuff considering that there's no Marlins game. But uh, yeah, we will, once we determine what we're going to do there and have confidence that the audio issues are going to handle themselves, we'll have another state of the fish there. But other than that, just looking at this not upcoming week, um, the Dodgers series Tuesday to Thursday, we'll have fish on first live for the prior to the Tuesday game here on YouTube at 5.30 p.m. And then the weekend series in Philly, uh, they'll be Friday to Sunday. So our, our live stream will be at 6 p.m. Eastern time on a Friday prior to that. A lot of articles in between um, about 
Yuli and Wendell and what to do with them the rest of the year. And uh, I think I'll have something on Sandy because a heads up that Sandy's birthday is on Thursday. Sandy Alcantara's birthday. I want to put into perspective what he's already accomplished through his uh, first 28 years of life and his first uh, parts of seven seasons in the big leagues. I think that will be interesting. We'll come up with some other stuff uh, in between then. Yeah, but I, th I think I'm going to call it a wrap on this again, sorry for everybody that was planning for the usual spaces here. Um, that we just technically it was not working out for the people on Twitter were not able to hear it, and that is a lot of the uh Twitter, a lot of these space audiences on Twitter, of course. So I've been Eli Sussman. We thank you guys all for your support. As it's been scrolling across the screen, consider becoming a super subscriber if you are not already. It's right up there near the top of the page on fishonfirst.com. Starting at just three dollars a month, that is going to be pretty increment, pretty indispensable towards helping us uh, put together the best possible end of season coverage, possible postseason coverage, and of course the off season coverage, which is spicy, uh, no matter how the uh, rest of the season finishes. Um, so yeah, I'm going to close this out here, but we should have a regular Twitter space coming up coming up uh, in the next day or two. So I will keep you guys all posted on that one but we're gonna close this one out here thanks again for your support go fish